Hey, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello. All right. So um, I don't actually know what I'm going to say to start this out. Um, I am so thrilled to be back here. This is, feels like my home conference now. Um, and it's just, it's so special to be back here. Um, can we get an, a round of applause for Beckett, please? <laughs> and, and can we get um, a really big round of applause for, uh, for Jason and Shannon and everyone who has worked to put this thing together? So uh, this year, uh, 2018, it's 2018, right? Uh, this year is a kind of an anniversary year for me uh, because 20 years ago this summer, I was taking an advanced C and C++ course at my local community college. And... Um, I was nailing all of my assignments, but I still needed a final project to tie up my grade. And coincidentally, at the same time, my dad uh, was working as a programmer at Raytheon, and he was working with a team on this air traffic control radar system. <clears throat> and they, ha they were in the process of transitioning from C to C++, and they were having some adjustment pains, and you know, I was studying C and C++ at the time, uh, and he got the bright idea that I could come consult with his team, and I could then uh, use that experience for my final presentation. And somehow, he managed to convince his boss that this was a good idea. And so there I was, this 18-year-old you know, kid in a tie-dye shirt sitting in an Applebee's in Towson, Maryland, uh, with a bunch of button-down middle-aged engineers trying to sound like I knew what the hell I was talking about. Mostly what I remember is just saying polymorphism over and over again. And, you know, and they're all kind of, uh, you know, they're all kind of nodding at me going, oh, yeah, polymorphism, yeah, good point. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I got through my class. Um, it was a terrible presentation, I, uh, but, uh, but I got through the class. And uh, a few months after that, I got a call from the engineering manager, uh, at Raytheon, uh, asking if I wanted to come work for them uh, as a contractor on the very same project. And that was the beginning of my professional software career uh, 20 years ago. By the way, uh, this, is, uh, this is a picture of that radar. This is at Atlanta Airport. Has anybody ever flown into Atlanta Airport? You're welcome. So my career uh, in software these past 20 years has centered around, I've realized it has centered around object-oriented programming from the very beginning. That is where I got my start. I have been doing this stuff uh, you know, for a while. Uh, and what I found out along the way is that almost everything I thought I knew about object-oriented programming was wrong. Uh, I don't have time to talk about all of the OO fallacies that I had to unlearn over the course of the past 20 years. That is another talk. Uh, but I do want to talk about one, of the, one fallacy in particular today. But before we get into that, what does it even mean to be right or wrong about object-oriented programming? Who gets to define this anyway? Well, the thing is, OO is not like Agile. It is not something, some consensus that was defined uh, by a committee uh, to bring a bunch of concepts together. OO, uh, while it builds on many ideas that came before it, object-oriented programming as a design paradigm was invented and named by one person, and that person is, is Alan Kay. So Kay and his team at Xerox PARC, uh, they came up with this, he came up with this idea and they created a programming language around it, a programming language that was intended to embody as much as possible this concept of object-oriented programming. And the language was Smalltalk. Uh, has anybody here ever used Smalltalk? A few people, oh wow, okay. Um, so if you don't know, Ruby's object-oriented features, uh, its object model is based almost exactly on Smalltalks. So when you're using objects in Ruby, you're basically using Smalltalk-style objects. So it's very true to the original 
uh, the original sort of reference implementation that K came up with. So if I talk about what is and is not object-oriented, the source of, of my authority, such as it is, is Alan Kay uh, and the things that he has written or said over the years about what he meant. Okay, so what does K say that OO means? He never laid down like a formal definition, but here's one of the, the shortest and most pithy explanations he's ever given. He said, OOP to me means only messaging, local retention and protection and hiding of state process, and extreme late binding of all things. So I eventually came to understand that that, that was the definition of object-oriented programming. Um, and kind of got away from a lot of the things I learned earlier on. But even after learning more about the history of OO, there was still one massive fallacy that I had yet to confront, that I had yet to understand and get beyond. And that is the one that I want to talk to you about today. This actually isn't it, uh, but this is a good place to start. Early in my OO programming career, I thought that OO was all about calling methods. What does it mean to call a method? Well, it means you invoke a procedure on an object rather than passing an object to a procedure or passing a struct to a procedure. Simple. But later I learned that OO is really supposed to be about sending messages. In fact, Alan Kay even said he regretted calling it object-oriented programming because the focus really should have been on messages. And even later, I learned from Sandy Metz that I should stop trying to identify the objects first. I, I should identify the messages I wanted to send and then figure out what object should receive that message. And this made things a lot easier. Okay, so what is the difference between messages and methods anyway? Here's how I learned it. When we send a message, the object we send it to gets to decide what procedure to run. Different objects can implement different methods for the same message. And this is in contrast to statically compiled uh, code in which procedure calls are all hard-coded. The compiler knows in advance exactly what code is going to be invoked as the result of a call. So it's basically, it's a form of late binding, uh, doing, uh, deciding what to do at the very last possible moment. In other words, messages are, there's that word again, polymorphic. All right, can we talk about this word real quick? I hate this word so much. <laughs> For years, even after I learned what it meant, I still had to keep reminding myself what it meant because it just doesn't sound like what it's supposed to mean. I mean, it sounds like it ought to mean that an object can take on various different shapes, like a T-1000 from the Terminator movies. But what it really means is that if you send the vocalized message to a pig object, it'll say oink, but if you send the message to a duck object, it'll say quack, which, I mean, yeah, they would. Because the thing is, the word polymorphic is only meaningful if you're coming from a baseline of a statically compiled, non-object-oriented language. In a dynamic, object-oriented language, it's just a really confusing way of describing the way you would expect things to work. I have been doing this stuff for 20 years now, and this term has not grown on me one bit. It is still terrible. Can we please declare the end of this word once and for all? Anyway, back to methods and messages. So we had established that a message is a way of invoking a method where the actual def definition of the method is decided at runtime based on the type of an object. And this makes sense as the definition of sending a message, right? Sure it does. I mean, right? This is the definition of, of message that I learned. It's the definition that I have been teaching people for years. But just for funsies, let's, let's compare the object-oriented definition of sending a message with the original definition. Let's compare it with sending a message through the mail. When we send a message in the mail, we include everything the recipient might need to know in order to act on the message. If they need information from some other document, well, you know, we summarize it for them. We include that. When we 
send a message to an object, we can include references directly to any other object we know about. We can send along the whole kitchen sink if we want to. When we send a message in the mail, we walk away from the mailbox and get on with our day. We may or may not even receive a reply. There is no guarantee of a reply. But when we send a message to an object, it is synchronous. We freeze until that object is finished processing the message. And in some languages, we're, languages we're guaranteed to always get a reply in the for, form of a return value, even if it's just nil. When we send a message in the mail, if we send it in a language the recipient doesn't understand, nothing happens to us. But when we send a message to an object that doesn't understand it, our whole thread of execution blows up. When we send a message in the mail, we know it might not reach anyone at all. But when we send a message to an object, we expect that it will be either handled or our whole thread of execution will blow up. Boy, you know, these things are starting to sound not like messages at all. But they must be messages. Everything we've learned about objects says that the concept of messaging is central. Let's take a quick break for a Zen parable. One day, the master said to the novice, when you achieve mastery, you will be able to move objects using only the power of your mind. And the novice said, but master, I have lived with you for 10 years and I have never seen you use this power, even to bring the TV remote to the couch. You always just tell me to fetch it for you. At this moment, the novice was enlightened. <laughs> Here is the big lie of object-oriented programming for the last 40 years. Just like the Zen master, we keep promising the power of sending messages. We keep saying that we're sending messages, but we're really not. Alan Kay envisioned objects as being like biological cells or individual computers on a network, only able to communicate with messages. But even small talk, the language intended to embody OO principles, never fully implemented the messaging idea. In some ways, the small talk of the early 1970s was actually closer to this ideal than anything that came after, uh, which is something that we're going to get back to a little bit later. Which means that every OO language has failed at delivering the central promise of OO. But we keep talking and acting as if we are programming with real messages. And this is why it's so hard to learn and to teach OO programming. This is why it is such a slippery concept, because our words and the reality don't match. My goal here is not to destroy your faith in object-oriented programming, but cognitive dissonance is dangerous. It rarely has positive outcomes. And for decades, we have been telling ourselves that we're programming with messages when we very obviously are not. Now, a lot of people will tell you that the original sin of object-oriented programming is mutable state. I disagree. I believe that the original sin of object-oriented programming is return values. Return values are a fundamental denial of the messaging model. Synchronous method calls with return values feed into a pervasive design problem that affects a far larger slice of the programming ecosystem than just the object-oriented subset. See, there is a monster stalking the programming labyrinth, and in my view, it is the cause of more confusion, more technical debt, more rework than any other misconception out there. And I call this beast the transactional fallacy. The transactional fallacy occurs every time a developer models a process as a transaction. Here are some properties of a transaction. It has a goal and no existence beyond that goal. It is synchronous. It blocks until it finishes. You can't put a transaction aside until, for later. It is, assumed, it is assumed to complete in essentially, essentially zero time from a human perspective it is not supposed to be able to hang indefinitely. 
It either completes or aborts. There is no concept of partial completion. It has no intermediate steps, at least not externally visible ones. And if it runs into an error, it self-destructs, leaving nothing more than an exception in its wake. There is no possibility of resumption. The transactional fallacy has a symbol. <laughs> You're probably familiar with it. It's the spinning beach ball of death. This is the universal symbol that a programmer expected something to either finish or fail more or less instantaneously, and it did neither of those things. Every time your workers are crashing because a web service is unexpectedly taking minutes to reply, that's the transactional fallacy. Every time your program freezes while it's parsing a big hunk of, of input, and you realize that even to show an updating status percentage would take some serious re-architecting, that's the transactional fallacy. Every time you, you have a background job that, where it turns out that 5% of the runs require intervention from a human person, and you have no idea how you're going to incorporate human feedback into this process that was supposed to be completely headless. That's the transactional fallacy. Every time you have a bunch of stateless service objects and you find yourself looking for a way to tunnel data, bundles of data from one service, to, from one service object to another because there's a workflow that used to be one step, but now it's two steps, or now it's three steps. That's the transactional fallacy in action. Every time you have a directory full of service objects, they're all related by implicit workflows from one service to the next, but the workflows aren't documented anywhere. It takes weeks for new hires to understand the hidden dependencies in between them. That's the transactional fallacy. Trans processes modeled as transactions. Every time you need to massively rework your code, because it turns out a form needs to be multi-page, it's the transactional fallacy. Every time you have to rework your code again, because it turns out that people painstakingly enter data into the multi-paged form, and then they come back after their session has expired, and now they're mad at you because they lost all their work, that's the transactional fallacy. Every time you have to rework your code again, because it turns out we actually need to run queries on the incomplete form submissions, that's the transactional fallacy. You know, whenever I take my kids to a new doctor, I have to spend 15 minutes filling out intake forms. Does anybody feel my pain here? Uh, I hate it. But at least I know that if I put the clipboard down, the forms won't reset themselves. <laughs> at least I know that I can take, I, that if my kid gets called back into the office, I can take the forms with me into the consulting room and I can continue filling them out asynchronously while my kid is getting checked out. At least I know that, you know, I can leave some fields blank, and if they really need to know, they can call me. I shudder to think what the intake experience would be like if it were designed by a programmer. But the transactional fallacy goes beyond just code. We fall prey to the transactional fallacy in our projects when we look at them as a bunch of features to complete instead of as facilitating human organization and workflows. And the transactional fallacy can crop up in our individual lives as well. Here's a conversation I've had a lot. You know, Abdi, I am making some really, really uh, positive changes in my life. I've applied, I applied for a job last week. I, I think I'm a really good fit for it. Oh, that's great to hear. Uh, what are you doing uh, while you're waiting to hear back? No, I'm just waiting. Have you ever felt yourself paused, just waiting for some development in your life? Anyone? Of course you have. Everyone has. Our brains are wired to want to come to a resting state. They want to spin down and stop burning all that glucose. It's expensive. But even without coming to a rest, we can still find ourselves living transactionally. And I know this because I made this mistake. So I want to get uh, a little more personal now. I told you at the beginning how I started my software career 20 years ago when I was 18 years old. 
And this was also the start of an almost 20 year long transaction. Because I had a vision of the life that I wanted. I wanted a wife and lots of kids. I wanted to live in a house in the woods and the mountains. I wanted to work from home surrounded by my kids. I wanted to homeschool and homestead. I wanted, to, I wanted tire swings and tree forts. I wanted to be snowed in with a roaring fire and nowhere to go. I wanted to look out from my deck a little above and away from the world and, and think slow thoughts and write things about what I thought about the world and about code. I wanted all of these things. And so I started myself on a path to accomplish them. And two years after starting my career, I kick-started my family dreams by becoming a husband to a woman I barely knew and a stepfather to two young children I was totally unprepared to raise. I was 20, 20 years old. And after that, the money was always tight. And especially after we had more children, the money was always tight. And so I set myself single-mindedly to the task of advancing my career so that I could accomplish that goal, that end that I had in mind. So every, after that, every choice that I made, the choice to, to work late, to neglect my hobbies, any time I chose whether to switch jobs if I felt like one wasn't getting me where I needed to go, the choice to raise my profile with blogging and with podcasting and conference talks and writing books. Everything I did was in the service of this one singular vision. I was focused and I was relentless. And I told myself I wasn't like other ambitious men. I didn't want ever increasing money and power. I had a goal and I was going to reach it and then stop. And along the way, like any good transaction, I lived in the future. I thought to myself how when I got there, I'd have game nights with my kids. When I got there, we'd hike every week. When I got there, my partner and I would go on more dates. Just a little further. Just a few more 12-hour days. Just a few more years. Even when our values started to change in ways that suggested that maybe, perhaps, our dreams should be updated, I did not waver. Even as we were miserable and unfulfilled in the present, I stayed the course. My life was a synchronous transactional function. I was fixated on the return value. And I made it. Bet you didn't see that coming. I reached the end of the road. Literally, as I drove my aging Buick with two yowling cats in the back up a steep mountain driveway and saw the rest of my family come pouring out of our new Tennessee home with huge smiles on their faces. And it is hard to describe that feeling. I had finished. At the age of 35, I had literally accomplished everything that I had set out to do. And I got to enjoy that feeling for two years. About a year ago, my wife told me she was leaving me. And to be honest, I think we both knew it was something that should have happened much, much earlier. But as we worked our way painfully through our agreements for the separation, I realized that as side effects, nearly every part of the dream that I had worked for all those years was going to be disassembled. And in the aftermath of this, there were many, many revelations. One was just how transactional my approach to life had been. I realized I had been trying for almost two decades to bring my life to an end. Not an end in death, but to a static state, a fixed state, a return value, exit zero. Have you ever seen the Lego movie? Well, for those who haven't, sorry, spoilers. Um, I realized I had become Lord Business. I was trying to get everything just so, so I could freeze it in place forever with crazy glue. 
You know, all the motivational writers and life coaches had said, create a concrete vision of the future and then work towards it. And my vision was so concrete that I lost sight of the present. It wasn't a revelation that my partner and I had been miserable together since nearly the beginning. That much had been obvious. But transactions don't take notice of intermediate statuses like that. Transactions don't alter course. They only have two possible outcomes, success or failure. You know, as programmers, we are prone, I think, to, to thinking in terms of problems and solutions and outcomes and true-false and success or failure. And in terms of transactions and seeking towards a finished state. I have become my own spinning beach ball of death, frozen on waiting for the next phase to complete telling myself, once the function returned, then I would start really living. Now, this, it may seem like I am stretching this transaction metaphor a bit, but if there's one thing I believe about our profession, it is this. As above, so below. Which is my way of saying, you can't expect to do something eight hours a day, but expect it not to have influence on the way you approach life. And vice versa. So is there a an alternative to the transactional fallacy? Now let's go back to Alan Kay for a minute. Alan Kay and small talk. Remember, he said this, I thought of objects as being like biological cells or individual computers on a network, only able to communicate with messages. Cells and or individual computers on a network. Does this describe a transactional system? Hardly. It sounds some like something much more asynchronous, independent and resilient. And when you dig into the history of small talk, you discover the seeds of something more interesting than the sham messaging systems we've learned to cope with. So this is an example of, of some code from the early small talk 72 system. This small talk class is also a function. It is a function that pattern matches on the messages it receives and decides what to do based on the match. And if it wants to, it can decide to ignore a message completely. Now this might ring a bell for some of you. Because if you squint, it looks a little like Erlang or Elixir code, pattern matching on incoming messages. And that's not a coincidence. Carl Hewitt saw Smalltalk 72, and it helped inspire the actor model that he later developed, which would go on to influence the design of Erlang. So here's the colossal secret at the heart of object-oriented programming. It was, it was never supposed to be about objects at all. The vision Alan Kay has described was more than objects as we understand them. He was talking about processes. If there is one fundamental change in, in how I've approached programming in the last few years, it's this. I've started trying to look for processes. I've tr started trying to model systems as processes, made up of more processes. And this isn't really a matter of choosing the right programming language. Uh, no language supports this paradigm perfectly. I mean, we've already talked about how this, all the so-called object-oriented languages have failed at this. Now, I mean, actor languages like Erlang and Elixir, they can give you true processes and true messaging, but they draw a hard line at the cell wall. So outside, it's, outside the cell, it's all messages. Inside, it's all functions. It's not turtles all the way down. And if you, if you get your granularity wrong, well, you may be in for a lot of rework. So being process-oriented is more about your perspective. And you can apply this perspective in any language. It's about looking for the workflows in the human systems that we facilitate. And then explicitly modeling those workflows as processes instead of just modeling the individual steps. It's about examining every transactional assumption that we make and asking, how are we going to evolve this into a process when it inevitably turns out, what turns out to be one? Because in the end, just about everything is a process. Remember earlier when I said that objects are really good at, uh, actually I didn't say that objects are really good at modeling relationships because I cut that out of the talk, but trust me on this, objects are really good at modeling relationships, not so good at mo modeling things in the real world, uh, but they're really good at modeling relationships between things. And relationships, uh, as hopefully you all know, are processes. You know, uh, 
accounts are registered, confirmed. They're elevated, they go dormant, they are suspended, they are reactivated. Work orders are proposed, researched, negotiated, put on hold in an incomplete state, then agreed upon, then executed, then saved for posterity. Web service calls are initiated, partially fulfilled with a URL to fetch the next page of data, throttled, resumed, eventually completed. These are all processes. The project you are working on right now is a process. Your software team is a process. Your cells right now are constantly dying and being replaced, but you still have a coherent identity. It's not so much that you're a person as that you are constantly personing. And hopefully you will continue to do so for a very long time. Your life is a process, not a transaction. Everything that life has taught me over the last few years can be summed up like this. Look for the processes. Embrace the process. I am trying to learn to build graceful processes in my life and in code. So let's talk about what it means to build a graceful process. First, it means learning to love state. I realize this is not a popular suggestion these days. But state is simply the acknowledgement of time. Everything we want to accomplish with the help of computers involves the passage of time. State is the acknowledgement that any process in the world whether it's a workflow or a human being, is an accumulation of events and their lasting effects. Another way of looking at the same thing is that state is an acknowledgement of entropy. This world is constantly throwing chaos at us. And I've seen it suggested that human beings are essentially compression functions. We consume a virtually infinite stream of events in the, from the world and we generate a smaller set of events, the things we choose to say and write and do in response. And this is how we create sense and meaning. This is how we oppose entropy in a world that trends towards chaos. And this is what our software processes need to do. State is the acknowledgement that we need history in our systems. Stateless transactions are not enough. Alan Kay wrote this great post recently on Quora. Uh, he was responding to someone who is wondering if functional programming and object-oriented programming are incompatible. And he said, we need both progression in time for most, most of our ideas and rememberings, and we also want to reason clearly about how every detail was arrived at and to advance the system. But this doesn't mean that we have to be stuck with the bug-prone semantics of mutable state. Because Kay says in the same post, uh, we could allow real objects to be world lines of their stable states, and they could get to their next stable state in a completely functional manner, with no race conditions to get to their next version. And systems should be able to be rolled back to previous versions, including their values, not just their code. He wraps it up with this. Both OOP and functional computation can be completely compatible, and should be. There is no reason to munge state in objects, and there is no reason to invent monads in FP. In other words, objects with state are a way of composing functional calculations into discrete timelines. They are processes. As a human process, embracing state means starting where I am. You know, I'm planning on getting my first tattoo soon, and I realized that the reason I had held back for so long was that I was in love with the idea of a clean slate, of infinite possibilities, of not being hemmed in by the choices of history. I think for humans in general, but for programmers in particular, we love the idea of a clean reset, a reboot. You know, during the, the process of my divorce, there was this tiny, crazy voice in my head that said, you could try again at the same goals, the exact same goals, just with someone new. You could still do it. Do over. One of the hardest things in my life, to, one of the hardest things to accept has been the realization that getting older is a process of constantly closing doors. There are so many things that I will never do. 
There are so many people I will never be. Learning to love state means accepting entropy. It means coping with the idea that there are no clean slates. It means working with legacy code when all you want to do is a complete rewrite. It means accepting the damage done and moving forwards. Building graceful systems also means building reflective systems, systems that can examine themselves. And this can mean a lot of things. I don't have time to go through all the implications of this, but let's just focus on one aspect. When I, back when I worked on radar systems, they were composed of dozens of different hardware components and computer systems all networked together. And it wasn't possible to adequately test these systems in lab conditions. So instead, these systems constantly tested themselves as part of their normal steady state. Some of these, some of these components uh, a part of every single second they were turned on was devoted to running through a series of test scenarios, just making sure it's still working right, it's still working right, it's still working right. And then the whole system would test itself. Part of the system would send out a series of test messages through the whole system and make sure everything's still working right, and then check again, and then check again. You know, the, the enterprise and web applications I see now, they resemble that, uh, that radar system to a remarkable degree because they're composed of multiple services communicating with numerous remote APIs in ways that simply cannot be rep reproduced under lab conditions. As programmers, um, we've gotten a lot better over the years at doing developer testing. Particularly, I think, as Ruby programmers, we've gotten a lot better at this. This has been a, been a big focus for us, but it is time to move on. It is time not to stop doing developer testing, but it's time to shift the focus to production testing. Our systems need to be testing themselves constantly. They need to be reflecting on themselves. From a human perspective, one of the lessons I'm learning about being a reflective process is the importance of embodiment. You know, as programmers, I think we tend to try to be brains in jars. I think this is, for some reason, this is an ideal for us. We like to pretend that our ideas, our ideas can be completely separated from our bodies. But learning to be a graceful process as a person means acknowledging that you are an embodied mammal. It means learning to live in your body. And this can be as basic as learning some mindfulness meditation. Uh, for this, you know, I personally really love the, the writings of Thich Nhat Hanh, but there are w many, many people writing about this. Um, it can also mean exercising more. But if you do this, be careful. Because we hackers are so addicted to being brains in jars that even when we're running or hiking or lifting weights, we find ways of taking ourselves out of our bodies and getting back into our analytical brains. We measure and we quantify instead of learning to listen to our bodies. You know, the other day I, I got a new phone and I realized I'd forgotten to back up my weightlifting app. And I suddenly realized that I couldn't look at a weight and just know whether it would be easy or a challenge or impossible. I was completely out of touch with, my, with myself, with my own body. And what I am saying here is throw away your Fitbit. Learn to feel when you need to take more steps. Learn to feel your target heart rate zone. Learn to feel when you are dehydrated. Excuse me. For me, embodiment has also meant learning to value Instagram and selfie culture, really. I don't actually follow many programmers on Instagram. I mostly follow poets. But I do follow these two. This is uh, Lydia Halley, otherwise known as the Avocoder, and Alex, otherwise known as the Yogi Coder. Uh, each of them have tens of thousands of followers. Does anybody follow, follow these, them? Hmm. One, okay. They post, like, like any programmers, they post about what they're coding, what they're learning, what they're working on. But unlike most programmers, they attach, unlike like most programmer blogs, they attach pictures of themselves 
to each post. And to logical programmer brain, this might seem pointless. It's just purely extraneous data, right? But I think it is a powerful stand against the disembodiment that is so prevalent in hacker culture. It is a reminder that programmers are not, in fact, brains in jars. We are people. We have bodies. We exist in space. And I've been trying to do more of this myself. I encourage you to, to, to experiment with this as well. Post more of yourself online. Imagine if every time someone was wrong on the internet, they were wrong alongside their face and their desk and their cat and their kids' paintings on the wall. We need to make this more of a thing. Building graceful processes means failing forwards. When I was a kid, I read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series by Douglas Adams. Who here has read that? Awesome. So if you've read these books, you might remember that Adams wrote something about learning to fly. He wrote, there is an art to flying, or rather a knack. The knack lies in learning how to throw yourself at the ground and miss. It is the second part, the missing, that presents the difficulties. You know, and for years I thought of this as just a funny line. It was only very recently that I realized the profound philosophy for life that this represents. Because like I said earlier, entropy is unavoidable. And that means failure is unavoidable. Surprises are unavoidable. And you can't plan for it. Sometimes a scorpion just lands on your monitor out of the blue. Totally hypothetical example. Definitely didn't happen in my office. Now, what is the standard way for a method in a modern object-oriented programming language to deal with something unexpected happening? It raises an exception, right? And in the process, it throws away the current stack, all the local variables, probably closes down some network and database connections as well. It is the programmatic equivalent of seeing a, a scorpion fall down from the ceiling and burning down your whole house in response. Raise your hand if you have ever spent a significant amount of time adding code just to capture more contextual information when a particular exception is raised. Not actually fixing the exception, just trying to gather enough data to understand how is this even happening. You know, something I've noticed in software architecture is that the more focused developers are on preventing failure, the more catastrophic the failures tend to be when they finally manage to get through, and they always manage to get through. We need to start building systems that are focused less on preventing failure and more on understanding how we got there. We need systems that can offer degraded service instead of self-destructing. And to me, one of the most revolutionary trends in web application design lately has been the way that all the prompts that would ask, are you sure you want to do that? have slowly been being replaced, at least in some areas, with undo buttons. I love this. And I think one of the most fruitful directions we can take in architecting our systems is to start with this assumption of undoability from the ground up. We need to ask, how does undoability change the way we design our objects? And I think a lot of useful side effects are going to fall out of this choice. Um, if you're interested, one uh, really promising move in this direction is the trend that I've seen towards event-sourced architectures. In my life, I am trying to learn to throw myself at the ground and miss. I'm learning that I can't make my position unassailable. Entropy is always nipping at my heels. Everything is failing all the time. And the trick is to keep falling forwards. Or in the words of Buzz Lightyear, the trick is falling with style. Building graceful systems, building graceful processes means building systems that lean on their relationships. Systems that aren't perfectly isolated. Processes need to be built to understand that they exist in community. Uh, one of the most powerful approaches to software architecture that I've embraced l recently is teaching my code how to punt stuff to a human for help. 
And I particularly like this pattern where uh, when a system runs into some scenario that isn't yet covered in the code, and that might, might never be covered in the code, uh, instead of blowing up, it drops a ticket into the help desk system with all the relevant information for a human to handle. And more and more, I think this is the way we should be building systems. Not blow up by default, but ask for help by default. And the only way to make this possible without our systems freezing up with dialog boxes all the time is if we build systems out of processes that can easily be put on hold without losing state. As a human process, I've been taking a crash course in leaning on friends. See, when my life came crashing down, I found that in one way, I had done a really good job of providing a community for myself. I had many, many friends and acquaintances in the software community, and it was fantastic. I, I, many of them, many people made themselves available to me for support and for venting, um, and I'm profoundly grateful to them. Some of those people are here today. In fact, uh, going to this conference last year was huge for me uh, because it helped me realize that I have a life I had a life um, beyond my disintegrating family life. But on the other hand, I realized all of a sudden just how important it is to have local friends when things go sideways, and I had no one. And I think that this is an endemic problem among programmers. Part of being a brain in a jar is that we find it very easy to content ourselves with online relationships. It's not a big leap between believing we can divorce our ideas from the rest of ourselves to believing that typing text to a friend is just as good as getting a beer together. I took a Twitter poll around about this recently and over a thousand people responded and most of them felt that they did not have an adequate local support network. If you are in that 72%, and if you take nothing else away from this talk, I want to just really encourage you to prioritize making local friendships. Do it before something catastrophic happens in your life. I cannot overstate how important this is. There is absolutely no substitute for people who can come over and break bread with you when your life is falling apart, uh, who can cook for you or help watch your kids when you just can't function. And um, if it's helpful to anyone, uh, I, I wrote a blog post where I kind of broke down exactly how I started to piece together a local support system from zero, and hopefully somebody will find it helpful. Processes need a direction. See, processes are not just reactive to events. Processes need to have agency. Unlike transactions, they don't need to be trying to finish but they do need to have a sense of what values they are optimizing for. Building graceful processes means knowing what to pull towards. Consider modeling a web service request. We can model it as a transaction and then discover that it sometimes fails. And then changing the code to retry on failure often requires substantial rework at that point. But if instead of modeling it as a transaction, we expect to succeed, and instead we model a request as a process that is trying to acquire data, the notion of retrying is baked in right from the beginning. As a human process, what does it mean to know what you pull towards? Well, now that I'm no longer trying to build towards a fixed point, I do a lot of thinking about the purpose and the direction of my life. And this is surprisingly tricky. You know, because usually I'll do something like, I'll be like, okay, what do I want to do? Well, why do I want to do that? Well, why do, I, why do I want that? You know, I'll try to do like the five whys or the 15 whys, and however many whys later, um, what I usually find myself left with is a mission statement that's so vague as to be useless. You know, something like, my mission is for everything to be the goodest for everyone, everywhere, always. You know, don't want to leave anything out, right? So I found it, more useful, found it more useful not to have a goal, not to have a mission, but to have concrete images to pull towards. Not trying to create that exact image, but something to pull towards. Let me explain what I mean. 
Uh, so my, my friend Janelle Klein calls this having an arrow, something that gives you direction. One kind of arrow that I've found useful is my beer list. And this is a list of prominent people that I want to have a beer with someday. You will probably not be surprised to find that Alan Kay is on this list. I want to have a beer with Adam Savage of Mythbusters. I wanted to have a beer with Anthony Bourdain, but that's not going to happen. But see, I don't just want to have a beer with these people by chance or because I win a backstage pass or something like that. What I mean by it is that I want to become the kind of person who they would want to have a beer with. I want to find myself in a place in life where it actually makes sense for me to have a beer with them. And I know I will probably never have, and never actually have a beer with most of the people on my list. But the list gives me a criterion. It gives me a litmus test when making decisions in my life. Which choice takes me closer to being the sort of person who will end up having a beer with Adam Savage someday? It's clarifying. Another way I define my arrow is in terms of airships. So let me unpack that a little bit. Um, when I created my own company, I named it Shiprise because I am obsessed with airships. You know, these things, uh, lighter than aircraft, zeppelins, dirigibles. I want to see them in the skies again. Because the reason is because I find them a profoundly hopeful and empowering symbol. Imagine seeing this massive craft in the sky, just hovering there by its very existence saying, we can work with the elements instead of against them. We can rise effortlessly into the sky. We can transcend ourselves. And look, I know I'm probably never going to pivot my company to manufacturing airships. But when I'm making decisions, I think, what takes me closer to creating that kind of inspiration for people? What choice is the moral equivalent of building airships? That's my arrow. That's what I pull towards. Your arrow will probably look like something completely different. But think about what images inspire you like that. So I keep using this term, graceful processes. And you, may, you might be wondering where grace enters the picture. Let me explain this the best way that I know how. I don't have a lot of hobbies left, but one thing I still do regularly is I take myself out dancing. Uh, this is a show that I went to actually right here in Nashville a few months back. Now, when I go dancing, um, I, go to, I go to goth industrial nights um, and like electronic dance music shows. Uh, and if you're not familiar with these kinds of events, they are not known for their couples dancing. Everyone kind of does their own thing on the dance floor. So while I have been dancing for many years, I have never learned to dance with a partner. And every now and then, someone will try to dance with me. And it is never pretty when this happens. Uh, one time recently, someone tried to dance with me, and it lasted about 30 seconds before they stopped in the middle of the dance floor, and they said, dude, are you okay? <laughs> True story. But this one time recently, someone I had just met invited me to dance with them. And, you know, I'm like, I warn you, I have no idea what I'm doing. But they insisted. And it was a fiasco. I had really had no idea what I was doing. But every time I did something clueless and awkward, every time I botched a twirl, they made space for it. And they flowed into it. And they came around again with a big smile. And by the end, well, I was still awful. But I was smiling, too. And I was starting to pick up on their cues. And they were making us both look good. You know, the word grace is interesting because it has two different meanings. On the one hand, it means beauty in lines or in motion. But, you know, here in the buckle of the Bible Belt, we know it also has another meaning. Grace is something that saves you. 
And in that moment on the dance floor, I realized that these two meanings of grace are really one and the same thing. Because grace is something that makes space for you to screw up and turns it into something beautiful. Grace is taking the random stream of events that are thrown at you and creating meaning. Grace is being mindful and reflective. It's knowing where you stand in space. Grace is starting where you are. Grace is working with legacy. Grace is falling forwards and missing the ground. Grace is extreme late binding of all things. It's deciding what to do at the last possible moment. Grace is leaning in to the people near you and trusting them to catch you or at least to give you a hand up. Grace is living in the present moment, not in the future. Grace is laughing at yourself. Grace is forgetting what you're solving for and just knowing what you're pulling towards. And when everything has fallen apart, grace is what saves us. So live gracefully. Build graceful systems. And don't forget to dance. Thank you very much. <laughs>